But only a long-term, expensive study could settle the question troubling patients with no symptoms, like Pascal de Bock. He started AZT in 1990, as soon as he found he was HIV positive. The doctor who saw me, I asked him, is there any treatment? And he told me, yes, we've got this treatment. We still don't know exactly uh, what it does, but this is the only thing. And I was desperate to, to, to sort of cling on to anything that would bring me life or that would somehow sustain my life. But Pascal de Bock needed to know if it was worth going on with the drug when he developed what he fears were side effects. It became almost like a headache every day. As soon as I was opening my eyes, the headaches were there and they were not shifted by any type of medication. And that was literally me going up to bed and going to sleep with a headache and as soon as I was opening my eyes in the morning, the headache was still there. And how long did that go on for? Oh, it went on for, well, for two years. And I couldn't make up my mind whether that drug or that treatment was doing me any good or any harm. The Concord team studied more than 1,700 HIV patients at hospitals in Britain, Ireland and France. Half were given AZT early while they were still well. The other half got it only if they began to develop AIDS. Because of the known short-term benefit of the drug, the study had been designed not to stop early. Only after more than four years were the Concord team able to meet by the River Thames in Runnymede to hear the first news of their result. It was the longest and by far the most comprehensive trial of AZT. The French team, the British doctors and the company waited eagerly for the answer to their question. Did taking AZT early bring any significant clinical benefit? They found none long term. Taking the drug before the onset of symptoms did not produce any significant difference in survival. We showed no important clinical difference between the two policies of starting treatment early or later. So the first thing was one of depression, but on the other hand, that was a very important finding uh, because we felt that uh, we had shown that the benefit, the early benefit that had been demonstrated previously wore off. In fact, it looked worse. The figures showed that more patients died among those who took AZT early. 96 died taking it early, 76 taking it late. But the investigators were cautious and anxious to avoid causing alarm. They calculated that given the size of their samples of patients, the difference in death rates could be due to chance. It was not statistically significant. We were very concerned indeed to avoid scaremongering and statistically about 96 is the same as 76, even though mathematically they're different. But in fact, the result was the wrong way. The results were certainly the wrong way mathematically, yes. There was also a paradox. While it did not improve survival, taking AZT early did raise the level of patients' CD4 blood cells. So it should, in theory, give them longer life. But it didn't. It did seem to be a surrogate marker, a potentially misleading index. But this was one of the markers which the company had relied on in its own trials of AZT. Exactly. So we felt vindicated in our... Uh, reserve or scepticism about the what one could infer from the CD4 count alone. The Concord doctors had agreed to publish a quick summary of their initial findings, but as Welcome still maintained the value of CD4 counts, this led to further disagreement. The committee chairman tried to agree a form of words with the company to go as a letter in the Lancet. The company representatives wanted to tone down the wording of the letter. 
as the publication date uh, approached, uh, telephone communication was more and more frequent and more and more frenzied. And it really uh, almost degenerated into a matter of considering individual adjectives. We wanted to say the result cast serious doubt on the value of using changes in CD4 cards. It was serious doubt. The company were very keen that we should delete serious, so we deleted serious under pressure from the company. A week after the first Concord results, the letter appeared in The Lancet in April 1993. And a setback in the fight against AIDS. The findings come from the most comprehensive trial of the drug so far. The AIDS charity, the Terence Higgins... The Higgins British Trust. Drugs Company, Welcome, has made millions selling AZT. Today, its shares fell over 50 pence, or 7% of the company's value. AZT came under attack from patients in Britain, whose hopes had been dashed. I literally took the whole box of my tablets and put them in the bin. And then, well, all the side effects disappeared. Somehow I wanted to make the, the wider public know that there was something, a, a very darker side into that marvelous treatment to help those people who suffer so much. And then suddenly uh, the Concord uh, trial results just appeared and ah, oh, I felt really, really ecstatic. It was absolutely marvelous for me to realize that what the decision that I had made without somehow any medical advice had been the right one to make. But the Wellcome Foundation seemed less ecstatic. Four days after the Concord result at its London headquarters, the company briefed the press and city analysts like Peter Cartwright about the trial's findings. It wasn't the sort of meeting um, where maybe it's been laid on for months in advance and it's well scripted and well rehearsed and comes across as a, as a very slick and very professional affair. This one was a damage limitation, you know, called at short notice, and um, the company were, you know, yeah, on the back foot a little bit. Why do you call it damage limitation? Well, because the share price was, was falling very rapidly. The company told the press that an adequate analysis of Concord would show it to fit their own shorter term studies, suggesting that early treatment can improve survival. But this was the exact opposite of what Concord had found. One of the company's overhead slides shown to the press contradicted another Concord finding, saying survival appears to be correlated with CD4 cell response. If anything, Concord showed that there wasn't a, a correlation between CD4 and survival. So the whole exercise, and it's a personal view, was one of damage limitation. Was it a distortion of your findings? I think you could interpret uh, some of the overheads as a distortion of the conclusion, the main result, the bottom line of Concord. Both the chairman of the coordinating committee were outraged by this uh, behavior of the Wellcome Foundation. I composed a letter and sent it to the Wellcome, uh, protesting the misleading information provided at the city meeting. Did you get a response? We didn't. Panorama wanted to ask Wellcome staff about their comments to analysts and the press. Dr. Trevor Jones, then Director of Research, and Dr. Paul Fidian, a member of the Concord team. They both declined to be interviewed. Later that year, in December 1993, the whole Concord team met in a hotel at Paris Airport to approve the wording of their full report. There were disagreements on points of scientific detail and one overriding problem. Although there were lots of discussions about small points, and indeed we did accommodate some of the suggestions, uh, trying to work together on it, the real thing was the last sentence of the paper, and that was that the results of this study do not encourage the early use of AZT. 
In a compromise with the company, this conclusion had been left out of the first letter in the Lancet. Now, Wellcome wanted to delete it from the full report too.